You have before you a medieval fresco. It's in a little church in Romania and it depicts people struggling upward on a ladder, climbing a staircase toward heaven. Isn't this a picture of life? Angels are helping from above, but demons are attempting to pull them down from beneath. You and I are part of a vast spiritual conflict. It's a continual conflict between good and evil, right and wrong, life and death, heaven and hell, God and Satan. We read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The battle is cosmic. We can see this with the plague now, this virus that's covering the whole world. But it's also a personal battle. You and I are part of the struggle. In Christ, we've been given a relationship with the Father. But Satan can still discourage us and make us weak and ineffective. And it happens all the time. The oyster is a marvellous example in nature to demonstrate overcoming. When grit or some other foreign body enters the shell, the oyster produces its milky tears and, wrap around and wraps around the foreign body. These tears uh, gradually form a beautiful pearl. Surely the pearl is a wonderful reminder of the ability of our Creator to transform painful intrusions in our lives to create something beautiful. I looked up the Oxford Dictionary to find out what it says about overcome or overcoming. It says to win a victory over or succeed in subduing or dealing with be victorious and to make helpless. So an overcomer is someone who can deal with life's challenges and actually be victorious. Who are the overcomers? Well, Watchman Nee, a Chinese Bible teacher of the 1930s and 40s said that overcomers were normal Christians. He also said that overcomers are those who choose God's will in a situation, no matter how they feel. If overcomers are normal Christians, what is a normal Christian? The Apostle Paul gives us his own definition of the Christian life in Galatians 2.20, where he says, It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He's not stating something special or peculiar or a high level of Christianity. He's presenting God's normal for a Christian, which can be summarised in those words, I live no longer, but Christ lives his life in and through me. God makes it quite clear in his word that he's only one answer to our human needs, and that is his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Revelations chapter 12, verse 11, and they overcame him, that is Satan, because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their life even unto death. Let's look at this blood of the Lamb for a short time, our salvation. The Son of God died instead of us for our forgiveness. He lives for us for our deliverance. A substitute on the cross who secures our forgiveness and a substitute within us who secures our victory. God will answer all our questions in one way and one way only, says Watchman Nee. And that is by showing us more of his son as we rely on him. 
knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You can read that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. So our first step in overcoming is to be made right with God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're now united to the living God by his spirit through the death of his son. <clears throat> Secondly, it says in that verse in Revelation by that they overcame by the word of their testimony. The Oxford English Dictionary states that a testimony is a declaration supporting evidence. It is confessing in word and deed what the Lord has done for us. <clears throat> in Acts we read, <clears throat> excuse me, of Peter and John, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marvelling and began to recognise them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with him with them, they had nothing to say in reply. Let us warn them to speak no more to any man in the name, that is the name of Jesus. After the warning, Peter and John replied, We cannot speak, stop speaking of what we have seen and heard. Arthur Katz, you might have heard of him, he was a Jewish atheistic philosopher who had important positions in universities in the United States. He was on a train in Europe and was sitting opposite a new young Christian. He could see that she was and hear because he could hear her talking about the Lord. So, said Arthur, tell me, what makes you think that your faith is better than anybody else's religion? Her face lit up as she replied, Jesus is God, God is love, and Jesus is in my heart. As he continued his travels, he went to Israel. He couldn't get that young Christian and her testimony out of his mind. He talked with a Messianic Jew, and he was led to faith in Christ. Arthur spent the rest of his life sharing the love of God through word and deed. God's resurrection power is in the words and deeds of every Christian who is surrendered to God's will. At the turn of the 20th century, there was an asylum in the suburbs of Boston, USA. It dealt with severely retarded and disturbed individuals. Little Annie was one of them. She was totally unresponsive to others. The staff tried everything they could to help her, yet without success. She was like a little animal. Finally, she was confined to a cell in the basement of the asylum, and she was given up as hopeless. A beautiful Christian woman worked at the asylum, and she believed that every one of God's creatures needed love, concern and care. So she decided to spend her lunch hours reading the scriptures to her and stories and praying that God would free her from her prison of silence. Months went by and there was no, no response. She left little treats at the door of her cell still no response but then one day a biscuit was missing from the plate encouraged this lovely lady continued to pray read the scriptures and sing to annie eventually the little girl began to answer the woman through the bars of her cell the woman convinced the doctors that annie should be removed from the basement Within two years, Annie was told she was well enough to leave the asylum 
and enjoy normal life. Little Annie chose not to leave. She was so grateful for the love and attention she was given by that dedicated Christian woman. She decided to stay and love others as she had been loved. Anne Sullivan not only regained her sanity through the love and testimony of that devoted Christian asylum worker, she was led to a strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nearly half a century later, the Queen of England held a special ceremony to honour one of America's most inspiring women, Helen Keller. Remember, Helen was blind and deaf. When asked to what she would attribute her success at overcoming the dual handicap of blindness and deafness, Helen Keller said, if it hadn't been for Anne Sullivan, I wouldn't be here today. Because Anne taught Helen to communicate through an alphabet that Anne invented in writing on Helen's hand. Anne was able to persevere with a greatly disturbed child, Helen Keller. If you've read anything of Helen, you'll understand what she, was, what she had to deal with as, when Helen was a little girl. And so Anne created that alphabet. And Helen herself came to faith in Christ. And then we read in that verse in Revelation, they love not, the overcomers love not their lives unto death. Overcomers are not controlled by fear. We read in John chapter 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Believe in God or rely on God, believe also in me. And then in Philippians 4, Paul wrote this from a prison. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, a most amazing victory over fear and death is the gigantic battle that happened between David and Goliath. Recently, I heard someone on TED Talk, and he said that giants are not as strong and powerful as they seem to be. I do recommend Malcolm Gladwell on TED Talk. He, he tells the unheard story of David and Goliath. And this is, I'm going to repeat some of the things of what Malcolm said. But first of all, we can read of the story of David's defeat of the giant Goliath. It's found in the first book of Samuel, chapter 17, verses 20 to 58. It's worthwhile looking at that. David was a young teenager at the time. He was a shepherd who was skilled in the art of stone throwing. However, when he had to face Goliath, he ran into the battlefield to face him. If this battle wasn't going to be won by David, he would be killed and David's people, the Israelites, would be led into servitude under the cruel Philistines. However, Goliath was led onto the battle floor by an attendant and he moved very slowly. It's been said that Goliath suffered from a condition called granulism, acromegaly. It's the result of a benign tumour that caused gigantism and partial blindness. Other people, since Goliath's time, who've had this, um, who were giants, they had this same problem. They were partially blind. <clears throat> Although David only had one stick, a sling, and a bag of five stones, the giant yelled at him, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? His vision was impaired. He didn't see what else David had. But he didn't see the God who was behind David. 
He's only seen through the eyes of faith. David was able to confidently say, you come to me with a sword, a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of, armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day, the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David struck and Goliath, sorry, David struck and killed Goliath with his first stone. So my question is, are you an overcomer? Is the God of David your God? Are you allowing the Lord to be your strength as you face each new challenge? You may have come across this, but the Bible talks of a book of remembrance. This is found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. This is what the verse says. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. So when the Lord is listening to our conversation and he hears us talking about him and what he has done for us, he makes a note of us, a note of it, because it gives him great joy. If God records every time he sees us speaking well of him, then we need to keep a book of remembrance to record each time we see the goodness of God in our own lives. For example, answers to prayer, encouragement from a friend, when God gives us favour with people. I'm amazed because uh, I go to a women's prison and God has given me favour with the staff. It's been of him, not of me. Recognising God when he chastises us for a bad attitude. And so I give people, I keep a book of remembrance myself. I've done this for a number of years now. But I give this to prisoners as well, a little book, and I tell them to write in what they are thankful for, for that day. And I tell the Christians, especially, to write in it um, how God has blessed and encouraged them. In Romans 12, 21, this is a very good verse to remember. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When we're going through a difficult time and really discouraged, we need to do two things. Pray and then go out and do something good for somebody else to get our minds off ourselves. Yes, love the Lord and go and do good. May God encourage us to go on and be overcomers for him. Amen.